Earlier on today, apparently, a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that, actually, the weather will become very windy, but most of the strong winds, incidentally, will be down over Spain and uh, across into France. Good evening. Southern Britain is clearing up after the worst night of storms since records began almost 300 years ago. Thirteen people died in the gales, which took weathermen by surprise and wrecked hundreds of homes. Most of those killed were hit by trees and buildings blown down in the early hours of the morning. A crisis meeting of ministers called by the Home Secretary decided the emergency services were coping magnificently. In London, the wind reached 94 miles an hour, with gusts of up to 110 miles an hour in the Channel Islands. The south coast was worst affected. In Kent, five people died, two of them seamen in Dover Harbour. Two firemen died at High Cliff in Dorset, crushed beneath a falling tree after answering an emergency call. And at Hastings in Sussex, a man was killed by a beach hut being blown along the seafront. Elsewhere, another five people died in a storm first predicted last Sunday, but greatly underestimated by the experts. At noon on Wednesday, the weather system in the mid-Atlantic seems innocuous enough. By 6 p.m. that day, it's moving east. Warm air from the Azores is forced upwards, strengthening the depression beneath it. 6 o'clock yesterday morning, two separate centres develop. The depression starts to deepen as it enters the Bay of Biscay, but the weathermen still seem unworried. Earlier on today, apparently, a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that, actually, the weather will become very windy, but most of the strong winds, incidentally, will be down over Spain and uh, across into France. Yesterday lunchtime, the two centres begin to merge, making the depression more intense. Six o'clock last night, the storm gathers strength, forming itself into a spinning top of turbulence. Midnight, the centre of the storm west of the Channel Islands, the weathermen predicting Britain would miss the worst. But the storms wreaked havoc across the country. The emergency services said they had little or no warning. Many roads and rail lines were blocked by fallen trees. Tonight, about a million people are still without electricity. The storm is now approaching the Arctic Circle, but it's left behind a trail of destruction. There's not been a storm like this in the South Coast counties for as long as anyone can remember. Certainly the scale of the devastation hasn't been experienced since the Second World War. Houses and blocks of flats had their roofs torn away. People were rescued by firemen from buildings in danger of collapse. Two firemen were killed answering an emergency call in Dorset when a tree fell on their cab. Two Sussex policemen were lucky to escape when their patrol car was hit by a falling tree. This pile of flotsam is all that's left of the famous Shanklin Pier on the Isle of Wight. It had withstood channel storms for nearly a century, but last night gave up the struggle. It's the end of the pier. The owners say it wasn't insured, and nobody could possibly afford to replace it. All along the south coast, there's been wholesale damage to yachts and boat yards. The hurricane force winds which lashed the capital in the early hours of the morning were the worst ever recorded, up to 107 miles an hour. The West End took a battering, some department stores had their shop fronts blown out. By dawn the winds had died down, but the damage remained. Many roads were blocked by fallen trees. Commuters were advised to stay at home. Those who didn't had to find their own way around or through obstacles. The London Fire Brigade was inundated with a record number of emergency calls. In North London, firemen rescued a woman after a chimney collapsed. She fell through every floor of the three-storey house, but wasn't seriously hurt. Large areas of London and the southeast had power cuts. Overhead, electricity lines were blown down forcing generating stations to be switched out of the national grid to prevent an overload. The power failures and the fact that so few city workers made it to work meant that there were almost no deal struck on either the stock exchange or the money markets. Most dealers took the opportunity to go for an early and a long lunch. Down in the Thames estuary, a crane was blown onto its side at the port of Sheerness. Troops were called in to help clear up at a devastated caravan site on the south coast. 
a sealing ferry was blown aground near Folkestone. All 20 members of the crew were safe. There were no passengers on board. And further along the south coast, a graphic example of the power of the storm. A Sussex woodland flattened by the wind. At the Suffolk port of Felixstowe, the tanker, the Silver Falcon, was torn from its berth in a Force 11 gale, swept out into the harbour after first smashing into a jetty. The docks were evacuated in case of an explosion. Eventually, a tug was able to tow the tanker into Ipswich. At Harwich, the Home Office detention ship, the ferry Earl William, was also out of control in the Stour estuary. Tamil refugees on board had a frightening time as the ship temporarily ran aground before finding a firm anchorage. At Jaywick, a hundred caravans were wrecked. Campers were evacuated to a nearby school, damage put at more than a quarter of a million pounds. The camp's amusement arcade reduced to a pile of rubble. On the main roads this morning, drivers weaved their way around fallen trees. A number of lorry drivers were taken to hospital, and a motorist died in an accident at King's Lynn at the height of the gales. On the region's railways, there was total disruption today. It's likely to be 48 hours before the services are fully back to normal. Tonight, the winds, still strong, are slackening, and the clear-up operation is getting into its stride. Already, insurance companies are being contacted by thousands of people wanting to make claims, but it looks as if local councils, rather than the government, will foot the bill for clearing up the debris. Throughout the day, council workmen across the south have been struggling to bring order back to normally peaceful suburban streets. Trees had toppled in all directions, smashing roofs, chimneys and windows. The London Borough of Ealing alone dealt with 600 calls from people whose homes or cars had been struck. The job of clearing up will take time and seriously drain council resources. It's going to take weeks and weeks and weeks to recover from this. Uh, it, it's going to take an enormous amount of effort and an enormous amount of money. And uh, I hope that we can look to the government uh, to support us in this because the burden uh, on local ratepayers is going to be enormous. The government has yet to commit itself. But for victims of the gales, the immediate worry is who pays? Storm damage to property is covered by most household policies, but there's no cover for third parties. Say, if your chimney pot damages your neighbour's property, which isn't insured. And damage to fences and gates is rarely included. Insurance loss adjusters are already dealing with a stream of claims, and they say people can press ahead with repairs before the work gets authorised. If they can get hold of a builder, all well and good. Builders are going to be very busy in the next week or so, so they should do what they can to protect the roof, sheet it, put polythene bags in the loft, obviously take down anything that's dangerous and, and hanging. Uh, the insurers will stick by them, and they're happy for them to do that. When it comes to the many cars crushed and battered by the gales, the insurance picture looks like this. Storm damage is covered by comprehensive policies, but usually means losing part of a no-claims bonus. There's no compensation with third-party cover. Some estimates put the cost of the gales to the insurance companies and to the country at £100 million. The weather forecasters admit they got it wrong. They'd warned of a depression approaching, but they had no idea of its strength or direction. This morning, people woke up to devastation and forecasts like this one in the Daily Telegraph. It said the weather would have an unsettled autumnal look. We're in for a pretty wet and windy spell of weather across the UK during the next few days. You can see on this satellite picture behind me that, um, that this storm system out to the uh, southwest at the moment, that's going to be affecting the UK on Friday, bringing us all some wet and windy weather for a time. And then this next system you can see um, just to the south of Greenland, that's going to sweep across the Atlantic and affect the UK uh, during the course of this weekend. Looking a little bit further ahead, it looks like the start of next week is going to be pretty stormy as well for at least some parts of the UK. This is a map of the United States and what we can see here is uh, one area of weather kind of near the Great Lakes and this area of weather here is going to merge with this area of um, weather over the Caribbean and Florida to form a, a pretty powerful storm which is going to charge across the Atlantic uh, during the course of the weekend and affect the UK um, early on Monday. 
So thinking about Monday's weather then, um, we've got this area of cloud you can see across Florida and the Caribbean. It's going to merge with um, the cloud and weather system you can see here near the Great Lakes. And that will give us um, this kind of surface pressure pattern by early Saturday with a, a new depression just to the south of Newfoundland. And this brightly coloured zone here, that's a, that's a jet stream. And the reason why this storm is going to be such a powerful feature as it comes across the Atlantic uh, and affects the UK, or potentially affects the UK, is that it remains in phase with the jet stream as it crosses the Atlantic. So you can see as I run through the sequence, the system all the time near the bright colours, near the jet stream, and then this is the idea sort of early on Monday, and then you can see that the storm tracks across the UK um, during the course of Monday. Now, as I said, this storm hasn't formed yet, but modern forecasting and modern uh, numerical weather prediction models do give us a big advantage over years gone by in the sense that they can pick up uh, quite reliably sometimes on exactly when new storms and potentially damaging storms are going to form. And uh, in this instance, that allows us to uh, have more of a heads up about when severe weather could affect the UK. So although at the moment there's quite a lot of uncertainty regarding the track and the timing of this storm, we are reasonably confident that, uh, that, a, that a spell of pretty wet and windy weather is going to affect the UK um, during the start of next week. Warnings are going to be issued during the course of today um, for some parts of the country. The thing to expect is that on the southern flank of the depression, that's where the strongest winds are going to be, and the heaviest rain will more likely be on the northern and eastern flank of the depression as it affects the country on, on Monday. Still a little bit of uncertainty regarding the track and timing, but our best advice is to keep up to date with our website for the latest warnings through the next two or three days.